Next, political fires slow down help headed for Kansans trying to rebuild after losing everything to wildfires. Plus, do we need to defend the National Guard from the feds? But first, the problems with childcare keeping Kansas women out of the workplace. That's what we're talking about right now on Kansas Week. I'm Pilar Pedraza and this is Kansas Week. We'll get to that story in a bit, but first let's take a look at the governor's latest veto. Governor Laura Kelly Thursday evening vetoed a Republican redistricting plan critics say would have made it harder for Kansas only Democratic member of Congress to win re-election this year. The map split the state's only minority majority county Wyandotte in two. The governor tweeted out that it quote divides too many communities of interest and raises constitutional issues. In a full statement later she added that case law on guidelines for developing new maps is clear. And this one violates the requirement new maps not dilute minority communities' voting strength and do protect communities of interest and preserve the core of existing congressional districts. She also promised to work with lawmakers to find a consensus on what the new congressional district should look like. Kansas Senate President Ty Masterson called the governor's veto disappointing, saying the new map met all legal criteria while also remaining politically fair, saying all current members of Congress would still have won four years ago if this map had been in use back then. Kansas House Speaker Ron Reichman accused the governor of being beholden to New York special interests, saying, quote, it is no coincidence she pulled out the veto pen just hours after the ACLU told her to. Both legislative leaders promised to push for a veto override immediately. And here to look at these and other issues, I'm joined by State Representative Republican Pat Proctor from Leavenworth and State Representative Democrat, and I believe it's House Assistant major Minority Leader. That's right. <laughs> I almost switched our parties there <laughs> from Hutchinson. Thank you both so much for joining me. As we look at this issue, I think kind of the first thing that comes to mind is I think back to the vote on those maps and the vote in the House only had 79 votes for. That is not a veto-proof majority, but we also know that several members were absent that day. Pat, I'm going to start with you. Are there enough Republican votes to override a veto? You know what, I've given up uh, <laughs> predicting votes in the House and I'm only in my first term. But, um, you know, I, this issue, um, it's a math problem when you get right down to it. Uh, there are too many people now in uh, Wyandotte and Johnson County, so you can't keep them together. Um, you know, the, the House Minority Leader um, in, a, in the paper the other day said that he wanted to keep them together and then he drew the line through uh, Johnson County. We've drawn the line through Wyandotte County, um, but no matter how you slice it, you can't keep those two counties together. They're just too large in population now. Jason, what do you say to that? Well, it's true that the population is too large to keep together. I think it's not a matter of that you have to cut one of those counties or maybe both of those counties. It's a matter of how you cut it. And when you draw a line through the middle of a county and pull a significant portion of minority populations out, put it into a mainly white and rural area, I think that that is kind of at the core of the problem. Also, the, the notch of Lawrence where we just carved out Lawrence seems like such a blatant attempt to uh, dilute that community's voting strength as well. Um, I think it, it, the, the map never passed the smell test for me. It seemed like it was political in nature and I think there's a much better way to do it. What about the argument that even with this map, even with these changes, Sharice Davis still would have won two years ago? I think that we're looking through the, the wrong lens. It's not a matter of who would win what seat or whether it's Republican or Democrat. It's really a matter of do these communities belong together, uh, considering that we have to stay within the, the population requirements. Do the, do the communities belong together? Do they kind of hinge together? And, uh, and are you making sure that you're being aware and, and, and mindful of minority populations that you're not doing anything to adversely affect their voting strength. I think you make a great point. First, uh, I'd say that all of the congressional districts under Ad Astra, this new map, are more competitive than they were before. And the minority representation in my district, the second district, actually goes up more than it went down in, uh, in Wyandotte. So um, you're gonna have to divide up the third district. There's just no, uh, there's no other way around it. And uh, I, I think that what we've arrived at is the, the fairest solution. 
So if we look at the numbers, uh, if Republicans vote party line, they have the votes to override a veto. We'll have to wait and see if they actually do it, of course. But presuming a veto is overridden, are we looking at a lawsuit? I know there have been uh, points made that people plan if this map passes to sue in court. Yeah, I think um, my number one priority is we have a constitutional process and it served us well for 160 years. I want to follow that constitutional process and I want elected representatives, not unelected judges, drawing these maps as happened 10 years ago. And so um, I hope that's not the case, but um, I think that it'll almost certainly end up in court. But uh, the way that uh, you know the the way that we heard the voices of all the people before we began and uh, allowed plenty of time for testimony during the the committee process, I think it's going to stand up in court. Well, I think it's important to point out that the courts are part of the constitutional process. I mean, this is intertwined with how we make these decisions. And when the legislature fails in its duty to be fair and represent those communities, the court being brought in is part of that process. Um, uh, on its face, the legislature. He's, Representative Proctor talks about testimony. We have reams of testimony from the KC metro area talking about how they identify as a community of interest, and we largely disregarded that. Um, I, I just think it, it, it probably should head to the courts if, if there's an override, and hopefully the courts will do what they're supposed to do, which is look at this through the lens of what the Constitution calls for. All right. Well, we'll wait and see what happens with that veto override vote, perhaps in the next week, if leadership has their way. Meanwhile, how are difficulty finding good child care and the COVID-19 pandemic together keeping women out of the workplace? KU this week released new research drawing connections between those problems and rising unemployment among Kansas women. According to the Kansas Reflector, the Status of Women in Kansas report released Wednesday found COVID-19 is disproportionately hurting women. The study is the result of research from KU and the Kansas Women's Economic Development Task Force. It found while women accounted for 32% of unemployment claims before COVID-19 hit, after March 2020, they averaged 46% of the claims. The report pointed to caregiving responsibilities, the closure of in-person schooling, and work from home as contributing factors. Research from the McKinsey Global Institute shows women going to work can lead to as much as a 10 to 15 percent increase in economic activity in the state. Quote, when we reduce these barriers, it helps everyone, including our state's economy, to flourish, said Wendy Doyle, president of United WE. Now, when it comes to child care, and I'm going to kind of harp on this one because I've done several in-depth stories on the problems with child care in Kansas and the lack of it. And I have heard from parents, from daycare operators, from teachers and school districts, all saying that the biggest problem is overregulation of the daycare industry. And nobody's saying they don't want kids protected, but they're saying that they have convoluted, complex, sometimes even conflicting rules that they have to follow and that chases so many people away from it. Even if they start, they don't stick with it. Is there a way to dig through that and maybe straighten some of that out in the legislature? Jason? Yeah, I think absolutely we have to go back and look at some of the regulations. I, I think the legislature tends to be reactive, so my, my guess is that every one of the regulations that is in place is probably a response to a problem uh, as technology improves and, and society moves ahead, I think it's important to go back and see if a lot of those regulations are still necessary or if we have the means to address some of those concerns in a different way. Uh, but we should be doing everything we can to increase the, the supply and the affordability of childcare because it, it's, it's crippling our economy, it's crippling growth in rural areas, it's, it's keeping women from fully participating in our economy and that hurts the, the state at large. I've even heard city leaders tell me, had city leaders tell me that it's keeping entire families from coming to their community for jobs, even if the jobs are there because they can't find the child care. Yeah, that, you know, I, I'm going to take a little bit of issue with the, uh, the, the report in that it's not COVID-19 that disproportionately affects women and especially uh, women at the bottom end of the economic scale. It's our reaction to COVID. Um, you know, I really think that the, the uh, governor's lockdowns and um, all the mitigation measures um, have negatively impacted women more than, than uh, men. But 
Oh, it's such a complex problem. A big piece of it is just getting everybody back into the workforce, right? Because uh, a lot of the daycare issues, and a lot of the childcare issues, are because they don't have the employees either, and so it's a, and it's exacerbated by this this challenge of so many people who are still sitting on the sidelines um, that have not entered the workforce for one reason or another. I'm going to come back to what you said there about the lack of employees in the daycare system. It's often because those are such low paying jobs and obviously there are other better paying jobs out there in our economy right now and people don't want to take the really low one for what can be a very difficult job. And it's also paying for daycare. I mean, sometimes as much as 30% of a woman's average income in this state can go for daycare in a single year. It costs as much as a year of college in some places. Yeah. Is there a way to look at some state aid to somehow cut that cost? Well, you know, costs across the board are rising. I mean, the, the inflation problem, it's a spiral because the wages go up, the expense of goods go up, and then people need more money to, 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 to uh, maintain the same, the same standard of living. And so um, I really think that um, this is all kind of part of that, that complex issue that we've got right now with uh, getting people into the workforce. And uh, I'd also say that, um, you know, this also dovetails into the school issue, right? Uh, you know, last year I was part of the part of the group that was advocating to limit the amount of remote hours to get kids back in the classroom. That's another, another facet of this problem. The issue with childcare is it long predates COVID. I, I've been involved in conversations for the last 15 years about how to address the childcare shortage. The bottom line is, it, it's expensive for families, but yet the mean, uh, the, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the mean wage for a childcare worker is $10.90 an hour. Mean wage for a retail worker is $14.77 an hour. So we, we, but yet we also know that zero to three is the most important time in a child's development. We've never treated childcare like a profession. We've treated it like babysitting. The, we haven't invested the resources into it. And, and as a result, people have gotten out of the industry. It's hard to keep that going. Um, we could look at all the things and, and, and factor that, but this has been a longstanding problem. It, it's just that it was kind of brought to the fore because of what happened with COVID-19. All right, and we're gonna leave that there and move on. A national group is now pr pushing a bill that would prevent Kansas National Guard members from deploying overseas, but some don't like the plan. Cakes Jackson Overstreet says the biggest concern is what would happen to federal funding if the bill is passed. We believe that this is an issue that Kansans were not aware that we needed to address. That issue is whether or not Kansas National Guardsmen should be deployed to active duty combat without a formal declaration of war by the United States. Today, the Kansas Senate committee heard a bill that would outlaw just that. It's part of a larger movement by a national organization called Defend the Guard to push back against what supporters believe is unchecked military activity. They've been repeatedly deployed to the global war on terror in Africa, the Middle East. Now we're seeing the Florida and Georgia National Guards in Ukraine, Taiwan. But members of the Adjunct General's Office, which oversees the Kansas National Guard, raised questions about what the bill could mean for operations in the future, since the federal government provides 99% of its funding. If passed, this legislation could signal to the Pentagon and to the Department of Defense an unwillingness to uphold our sworn federal obligation. Without a federal mission, there's little incentive for the federal government to continue funding the Kansas National Guard. The bill would also outlaw COVID-19 vaccine mandates for Kansas Guardsmen, but senators say that would not hold up legally. I do not support vaccine mandates, but I am not the commander in chief of the military. Uh, the commander in chief of the military has decided that. Uh, that is currently being litigated in federal court and Kansas passing a law is not going to supersede uh, federal action in a federal court. So complex issue and Pat, I'm going to come with you first with your military history. What do you think about all this? Uh, so um, I serve on the uh, military, the Veterans of Military Committee and uh, la uh, late last year we sent a letter, me and a couple other legislators in that committee, sent a letter to the Adjutant General uh, questioning his authority to do the vaccine mandate. Um, and we got basically the same answer that you just saw in that video, which is, hey, uh, we get 90% of our funding from the federal government. I think these, uh, these unconstitutional vaccine mandates have really highlighted in a lot of areas just how deeply federal funds have permeated our, the, our state agencies, our businesses. And uh, I, I think that 
it raises the question, you know, uh, with what strings come attached with that. And so um, I don't think that um, this this bill, if it were to pass, would uh, would stand up in court um, because everybody who enlists in the National Guard enlists in the Kansas National Guard, but also in the National Guard of the United States, um, which gives the president you know, broad authority, and we haven't declared war in, <laughs> since <laughs> World War II, so it, it, it would practically mean they were unemployable. So um, I, I don't think it's gonna hold up, but I think it does raise questions about uh, what strings come attached to federal money. Yeah. Jason, what do you think? Well, I think that it, it's, I, I agree that it wouldn't hold up in court, and I also think that not every problem calls for a legislative solution. Um, w w w some people don't like the courts or they don't like who sits on the courts, but the fact of the matter is, is the courts are an integral part of how we resolve conflict in this, in this country. If people have disagreements, that's the purpose of the courts. Um, I think that it would be unworkable legislation. I think it, it wouldn't hold up in court. And I think it would also jeopardize the, the careers of a lot of people in the National Guard who are, are just trying to serve their country and aren't looking to be caught up into a political argument. There's a question here. The um, folks behind this push uh, and the Libertarian Party say that there is strong support for this bill in Kansas. But does support in Kansas necessarily translate to support in the State House? Yeah, I, um, I, I, you know, it's over in the Senate right now, so I don't have a good sense for uh, how far it's even, if it's even going to make it out of the committee. Um, but it, it's just, I think, impractical. Um, you know, the, the, Federal government really nationalized state militias 100 years ago, and it's <laughs> been this way for 100 years. And so the, the idea that we're just gonna, as Representative Probst said, just legislatively somehow uh, change that verdict, I just, I don't think it's practical. No. Anything to other? I, I just, yeah, this is, this is one of those things. I, it was interesting you said that they said there's a lot of support. I haven't heard much about it. I haven't seen this outpouring of support for it. Um, I, th I think sometimes groups uh, get an idea and maybe they, they kind of in an echo chamber and they hear a lot of support in their circles for it and they somehow think that translates into broad support when that's not really the case. Okay. Well, it doesn't sound like there's much to debate on this topic, so we're going to move to the next one. 29 Kansas dams are in poor condition, threatening homes, businesses, or state infrastructure. That's what the Kansas Department of Agriculture told lawmakers this week. The state's chief engineer with the Department of Agriculture said more than 600 dams in Kansas pose a significant or high hazard to the public if breached. The state has jurisdiction over about two-thirds of those. Quote, there are 20 nine out there where we need to have action, Earl Lewis told lawmakers. Some of these we've known about for a number of years. We don't have the enforcement tools. In those cases, Lewis said, the state must currently convince a county attorney to take court action, or the legislature could grant the Department of Agriculture the ability to impose civil fines on landowners who don't repair unsafe dams on their property. The Kansas Reflector reports he also told lawmakers Kansas should create an emergency fund to address dams in immediate jeopardy of failing and change state law to allow people to conduct dam inspections under the supervision of a professional engineer. Now, I've just been, and this may sound like an aside, but I promise it connects. <laughs> I've just been judging uh, uh, competition stories for broadcast journalism out of Michigan, where they just had two major dam breaches in the last year because of lack of repair on the dams. And this is not a small issue. When you see those stories, you see complete towns wiped clear of the earth. Think Greensburg, but caused by water. You know, what we saw in Natoma but on a, the, over the last year, but on a much larger scale from flash flooding. It is devastating. This is not a small issue from what I have seen from what breaching dams can do. Is there something that the legislature can do? Is there a will within the legislature to make some of these changes that are being asked for? Um, I, I serve on the transportation committee, not the ag committee, but I see a lot of parallels here, except the dams are an even more complicated problem because you've got private landowners and, uh, and it's, just, it's very complicated. But I, I have been pretty frustrated since I came to the legislature with the lack of transparency on decision making on what infrastructure does and doesn't get uh, addressed. Um, and so I, I think that 
the legislature would be a lot more willing to wade into this issue and uh, partner with the Department of Ag if there was a little bit more transparency from the executive branch on wh how the, the criteria they use to set priorities. You know, one thing I found interesting, uh, talking about the uh, transparency issue is in this presentation, they said there were 29 dams that were a problem. They didn't name any of them. Yeah, this is, this is you're, you're right, this isn't a small problem and it's not a new problem. I, my first year I was in, on the water committee and we were talking about these dams then. Um, clearly there's a gap in the law where we've created a regulation but we've not put in place a mechanism that allows us to address it. And I think it's a, a little bit dubious to get a local prosecutor to do it. He or she is also up for election but in this lo local area. Uh, so that creates some, some complications there. Um, but at the core, you know, we have a private, we may have a private landowner who has a dam, but if that dam poses a threat downstream to property owners, homes, a town, um, they definitely have uh, some, some call for action on that. Um, w we have to find a way to address this, and I would hope that the legislature would look and see what, what avenues we can pursue to try to address this. And I know we saw a couple of years ago here when we had all that flooding going on and we saw Cheney, especially in our viewing area, filled up to the top, El Dorado filled up to the top, overflowing, having to do releases out of the causeways. Just how powerful that water can be when it comes out. Another thing to keep in mind is that, you know, when we had the flooding a few years ago, I really learned how interconnected all these water systems are. I mean, a, a dam breach in one place, a, a, in addition to the property damage, it affects the watershed and it affects uh, how the, the, the Corps of Engineers calculates releases and things like that. Um, it's such a, a, a fluid system and it's such a connected system. I think we have to address this problem. And yet you said this is an issue that you guys were discussing years ago when you started in the legislature, still an issue, <laughs> so it hasn't been addressed yet. Yeah, we've got a, uh, you know, I live on the Missouri River here in Leavenworth, and so we have a lot of the, the federal issues with Corps of Engineers and how they set priorities. Um, that's really more of a concern in my district, but, you know, I, I was stationed at Fort Riley, and we lived right down down uh, downstream from the Tuttle Creek Dam, and so um, it's a, you know, it's a it's a huge issue, and I do, I do agree that it needs to be addressed. All right. Well, we'll wait and see if it actually does get addressed. A bipartisan effort, meanwhile, to provide financial help to victims of the December wildfires it hit a snag this week as the House and Senate disagreed on a Senate amendment. Senate Bill 318 is a direct response to the December wildfires that burned thousands of acres in western Kansas. It would provide a tax exemption on any materials used to repair or replace fencing destroyed by a natural disaster. The bill was on the fast track to the governor's office until this week. During debate on the floor, senators added a new section expanding eligibility for property tax abatements to allow for buildings and improvements to qualify if damaged by natural disasters, as well as fencing. The Kansas Reflector reports under current law, the Board of County Commissioners must determine whether to allow such an abatement request. Jay Hall, Deputy Director of the Kansas Association of Counties, told lawmakers this expansion would make the job of county appraiser almost impossible. That same property tax proposal failed to move forward on its own over the last two years. All right, so you hear a lot about kind of the rivalry between the House and the Senate over the years. Is this what we're seeing going on? Is there something else going on here? Because this seemed like it was pretty much a done deal the first week of the session. Jason. Yeah, one, this is one of the frustrating things to me. This, this is, you know, the, the tax relief for farmers and ranchers affected by the wildfires, that needs to get through and it needs to get to the governor's desk so we can get it signed and immediately start providing some relief for, relief for people. But the, one of the common things that happens is if somebody's got a pet project or something that they've been working on for a number of years, they find a bill that has to get done and they attach their, their priority to it. I, I really wish that we could just focus on Kansans, move this primary bill along and deal with the other elements independently because if they're worthwhile, they could stand on their own merits. They don't have to be embedded into a, a, a must have piece of legislation. Yeah, we had the uh, Linwood tornado a couple years ago, and uh, this piece of legislation that got tacked on to uh, the uh, wildfire bill was, I think, in part a response to that, uh, trying to give some kind of property tax abatement to those folks who had uh, uh, property destroyed uh, in the tornado. Um, I, I, that's a very important 
uh, a very important issue that I think we need to address because we have this all the time, right? We have an emergency and then we rush to pass a bill. Um, but I agree with Representative Probst. Let's just get this one through clean uh, to give immediate relief to folks that are uh, suffering the economic consequences, of the wildfires, and then we can come back around and we can address this broader problem of uh, giving counties the ability to respond to crises. So if the Senate doesn't budge on this issue, what are some of the other means that you guys can use to maybe get this through? Yeah, it's, I, again, I've, I gave up in the first session <laughs> predicting the, uh, the course of uh, legislation and its, uh, its uh, odds of passage. But I, 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 you know, I, I think that we have a, the leadership in the House and leadership of the Senate uh, work very well together, and I'm sure they're going to hammer out a solution. Jason. Yeah, I, I would hope that that would be the case and they could figure out a path forward. Uh, I think that the, the, the issue of offering tax abatements or making them available to people in an emergency uh, is not terribly controversial. I think most people kind of agree in concept with that. Um, but I do think it's important to hear from the people that would be affected by that. You know, there are uh, in rural communities, they rely heavily on townships and, and local special districts. I think it's important to have that conversation about how they're affected and there must be a way to, to work it out and figure out how it can work. But uh, again, it, you know, we're in agreement on this. It, when there's a crisis and we need to get the relief out, we just need to focus on getting that done. We can work out the differences on something else later on. Okay, well, these were the issues that I came up with for the week. Obviously, there were many more that I wanted to get into the show and couldn't. So I'm gonna ask you, what are some of the issues that maybe you would have liked to have talked to that we talked about today that we didn't get to? Pat? Oh boy, uh, <laughs> it's a, a picking one's gonna be difficult. Now, I, I think that um, the inflation problem that has gripped regular folks here in Kansas, um, we've got to do something to get more money back in the pockets, Kansans, so that they can combat this inflation. Uh, we've, you know, while while prices are rising and people are struggling to make ends meet, uh, the the state's raking in record windfalls, and so let's give that money back to regular Kansans because so, they know better what to do with it than we do, frankly. Jason? I, yeah, tax policy would be something I, I would like to talk about more. I think we, we do have record windfalls uh, in revenue, and I think it's important to have conversations about who should get the lion's share of that. In my view, it should go to working families, such as the food sales tax cut. Um, I think w we should be looking at every opportunity we can to help families out, whether that's supporting child care initiatives, uh, offering tax credits for families if they're paying for child care, or if it's more direct aid like, uh, like cutting the food sales tax. Okay. I'm kind of disappointed nobody brought up the uh, bill to allow driverless trucks. And <laughs> 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 I, I did a story on it, so I kind of knew a little bit about that one. Okay. Well, thank you, gentlemen, both so much, Pat, Jason, for joining us this week. I've enjoyed our discussion. Thank you as well. We'd also like to thank our partners at KSN News, Cake News, and the Wichita Eagle for sharing their materials with us. We'd love to continue the conversation with you on social media. Just look for Pilar Pedraza TV or PBS Kansas on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. For now, stay safe and have a great week.